Yes, yes, y'all. You are listening to DJ Cliff Presents, man. We are doing our thing like we always do. And I am I am honored and privileged to have an opportunity to talk to uh I'm going I'm to I'm say legend because this cat's been, he's been in it for a minute. And uh, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be to be doing this thing with Vex, the Vortex of the Boogie yeah. Monsters. What's up? Peace, peace. What's up, fam? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, brother. I'm so good, man. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for jumping on the podcast like this. Oh, all day, man. I always do what I can. You know what I mean? That's what's up. That's what's up. So, man, so much stuff to get into, bro. And. Um, you know, first and foremost, I just got to say that I am such a fan, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm just, it's, 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 it's kind of crazy to actually have the opportunity to, to sort of go through some of the history of what you've done and, and the impact you've had on the industry. So, uh, I just had to get that out the way. You just got to be fanboy for a minute, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, it's appreciated. I appreciate the love. You know, we had a sort of like a crazy, uh, goings with the labels and labels folding. So to have supporters that have like been there through all of those times to give us critical acclaim. I mean, anything you read about Boogie Monsters is folks like you out there showing us like the utmost love, which sort of made us, you know, the legends that we are in hip hop. So it, it's always appreciated. Thank you, man. Oh, for sure, for sure. So let's 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 sort of let's go back, man. I mean, I don't know how people couldn't. But just in case people aren't aren't super familiar, um, let, let's start at the very beginning. I was first introduced to you as an artist back in, it had to have been around 94, man, uh, when I first had an opportunity to hear the album that changed, no, I'm tripping, I was about to go all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> when I had an opportunity to hear the first Boogie Monsters album, man, um, and probably the first, you know, the first, the first thing that I heard was a single, uh, recognized thresholds of negative stress, yeah. the underwater album, man. Talk about like how that all, how that all came together. Um, it's a long story. Hopefully it's not too lengthy, but it starts like prior to that. Um, I was always in the hip hop from age nine years old. I was writing rhymes. My father used to actually sit sit down with me and help me like write stuff. And this was right around the time UTFO versus Roxanne versus Roxanne Shantae, Sparky yes. D versus <laughs> Roxanne Shantae was going on. That whole thing was going on. And I was just taken by it. Like, yo, wow, people like a little bit older than me are taking all these words and they're rhyming them and they're putting beats to it. And it was just incredible. I used to go to break dance contests at that particular time. I was here and where I'm at, where I am now in Maryland. And people were having break dance contests and, you know, people were wearing suede pumas and Adidas suits and hoodies <laughs> and playing Planet Rock. And I heard Planet Rock for the first time and I was like, wow, this is amazing. So it just rubbed off on me like immediately. I was just taken by hip hop. Um, I had my father sit down and show me like, well, what are they doing with bars of music? Like, how are they making these words work on bars? You know, so he showed me how you write lyrics, basically. So from that point on, I was rhyming. Um, I was a military brat, so my my father would move every three years. So I lived on Fort Meade. I ended up in Germany. Lived in Germany for three years where hip-hop was taking off over on the other side of the ocean in a whole completely um, different context. Yeah. Um, so I experienced that with some youth that were also military brats. We all went to high school together, and, you know, we played Chuck D and a lot of the greats, you know what I mean, overseas while we were like, you know, over there with our parents. So when I came back, my father was stationed on Fort Hamilton, which is an army base in Brooklyn, okay. in Brooklyn, New York. It's just under the Verrazano, um, which which is in a lot of popular movies like that area where the army base is, is actually in uh, like a John Travolta movie. Um it's like a pretty popular area, although the army base is somewhat, I don't know, sort of like secluded into itself. But I was there for a while. And when I moved from there, I moved to Virginia where I met the other two brothers that, you know, originally consisted of the group, which was Ivor Myers and Shawn Myers. OK, um, we went to high school together in Virginia, my junior and senior year. They were in the hip hop. Their parents had also moved from New York to Virginia. And at that point, we just started a group. We called it Vex and the Boogie Monsters originally. Okay. And they were like, uh, sort of like Scoop and Scrap. Okay. 
<laughs> and I was the MC, you know what I mean? So it was vexing the Boogie Monsters. Um, I ended up attending Virginia State University with uh, my brother Ivor. So we attended the same university, at which point we sort of kept his brother in who went to Virginia Union, which is right down the road in Richmond. That's what's up. And we picked up Mondo McCann at Virginia State. And okay. that's when we became Boogie Monsters. Okay, okay. Um, so we started like uh, doing talent shows on the campus. People started taking to the name. They liked us as like, uh, I guess, hip hop expressionists, whether it was the clothes we wore, how we got on stage and spit. There was a lot of ciphers and freestyles done at Virginia State. You know, hip hop was just like a part of that university at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we gained popularity. We ended up at the, uh, the hip hop convention at Howard that they have every year. Uh, Joe Jackson was actually putting on a talent show. So we entered the talent show and we won first place. Okay. okay. So it, it was sponsored by Joe Cola at the time. So he was sort of like, I guess, doing his thing and branching off from what he had done with the Jackson 5. So the fact that we won first pr- place gave us some notoriety in D.C. Um, as well as Virginia. And we also ended up taking the money and re-recording our demos. Okay, okay. So that's how it started. That's what's up, man. On the phone with uh, with the homie Vex the Vortex. So, um, you know that 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 original. Cl- it was kind of funny because going back and and looking at some of the old videos, it's interesting to see, um, you know, you and Mondo. Well, especially the two the two videos from the first album. I mean, for the most part, it, it's on those two cuts. So it's recognized thresholds of negative stress, and then strange. I think was the other one that I was checking out. I mean, it's really you and Mondo for the most part, um, uh, rhyming on those two on those two cuts. Yeah, it's interesting because they they uh, Ivor and Sean they like halfway through the project they decided they wanted to start rhyming okay. rather than you know do the scoop and scrap and dancing and back flipping and all some of the stuff you see you know and recognize thresholds and negative stress. Right, right. So it's sort of like a stopping point, you know. We all sat down and we were like, yo, are y'all sure y'all are ready to just transition from that to going on stage and, yeah, yeah. you know, just spitting lyrics? Because they hadn't really <laughs> been in any ciphers to see how their rhymes would be absorbed by other listeners. They hadn't really sat down and been lyricists for a minute like me and Mondo had been doing and ha- I had been doing prior. So. You know, they were like, no, we sure this is what we want to do. You know, we you definitely want to do the lyric thing. Y'all are doing it. You know, it would be better. Yeah. You know, they I guess they feel like maybe the dancing part of hip hop with brand newbie and having dancers and people having dancers, it was maybe playing itself out. And they wanted to just be more on the MC end. Right, right, so right. at the end of the conversation, we were like, OK, fine, let's all just do lyrics. But yeah. you know y'all are going to be nervous <laughs> when we get out in front of these crowds because right, right. you never really, you know, spit like that. You yeah. know what I mean? But they were willing to take it on, and that's why the album sounds the way it does. Um, we also had this thing where we wanted to sort of spin off of what Tribe was doing, where one artist out of the group would just do a song to themselves. Right. Right. So you also had music appreciation where it was just me, and then you had Bronx Bombers, where it was just Mondo. But then you had those songs like Boogie, uh, where you might have My Trick doing the hook, Sean doing the hook. Uh, we had Riders of the Storm, where it was all four of us and some of our other crew from Virginia State, the X-Men, Riders of the Storm crew. They're on the, on the title track. Okay. Um, Alter States of Consciousness, we all gave, one, gave a verse. So it's sort of like a hodgepodge of what was going on within the group that people couldn't really see from the outside. But there's some changes and transitions going on during the recording of the first album. And some of it also had to do with the lyrical content. So yeah, yeah. that's a whole nother story that sort of branches off from how the Boogie Monsters, you know, came out professionally, so yeah. to speak. That's what's up. Well, let me let me. So so obviously everybody's going to have it going to have a uh, they phase. But let me just say so on um, on the first project on Riders of the Storm, I, I said I said it like three times already, but recognized our souls, negative stress, probably like number one joint on the project for me. Love that cut. Um, <laughs> Strange is super dope. And then but like when I had the album, when I, when I had the album in my hand, listening to it. Um, probably for the first time, the 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 song that really like had made me go back and really re-listen to it was Old Man Jacob's Well. Speak on that mm-hmm. right quick, like how that even came about, and I mean, cause that song is really deep. And I don't know if you know if everybody 
you know, sometimes you you know you put art out there and people don't get it at first. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was like something we did to challenge ourselves as well as hip hop. Like we like street, you know, we we were into street music. Uh, there were some popular records that were real gritty at the time. The Chronic was real popular at the time when we were becoming a group. So we get what what hip hop is about as far as it coming from a street aspect of life in the hood and urban areas and ghettos. We got all of that. We weren't like these squeaky clean college guys who didn't relate to hip hop and what people feel is its essence or what, what was the essence at the time. Cause prior to that, it was all about peace, love and having fun, but we were into that aesthetic, but we wanted to challenge also what we consider hip hop and what hip hop could be about. Since we had so many street records talking about, you know, drug dealers and guns and being gangster and being thugs. We were like, how about we have a song about a subject matter that nobody really wants to address or talk about because it's sad and it's somber and make it a hip hop song and challenge hip hop listeners to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. We're like, OK, well, well, what's going to be the subject matter? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So we're like, how about, okay, I'm like, how about ch- child abduction? You know what I mean? Let's see, we got this old guy, let's say his name is Old Man Jacob, and he's he's kidnapping kids. He has some sort of mental issue going on, and he's grabbing kids and, and abducting them, and he's hiding the bodies in a well. Yeah. Everybody's like, wow, that would be really deep, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, inside of that, you know, the, the, the name of the group sort of played a part in the subject matter that we were choosing because our name was the Boogie Monsters. And at the time, we felt like Boogie Monsters represented uh, things that are placed under the bed that no one really wants to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Things that may not necessarily be monsters, so to speak, but just issues and subject matter and people that society doesn't choose to address. Maybe because they're undesirable, the subject matter is undesirable, um, you know, some people might consider the black man boogie monster. Right. If you look at the hashtag boogie monsters in some right. areas, you know, people right. are sort of taking the, the name and the word and making it another context. But in the context of how we were seeing it, we just felt like, OK, let's let's broaden hip hop's horizon, so to speak, and put in subject matter in this album that the average MC is not going to spit about. Yeah. And really make people sit back and think like, yo, somewhere out there, there is an old man, Jacob. And he's out there taking lives. Yeah. And it's not gangster and it's not in the, in the aspect of a street record or anything like that. But it was enough to engage a listener. And when the song goes off, you're like, wow. Exactly. Exactly. Where did I just, before was I just taken? You know what I mean? Yeah. And so the producer, uh, Derek Jackson, when he heard it, he just got something totally even more out of the song. He got something else. He was like, when I was in the studio and I got you guys lyrics, I was like moved to change your voices into the actual person I felt old man Jacob would sound like. And Mondo was the kid and he changed Mondo's voice. And when I originally heard that, I didn't really like it. I was like, oh, it's just too much. You know what I mean? It's almost creepy and scary to hear this voice that isn't me doing my lyrics like that, you know? But he was like, it was almost like an out-of-body experience for him. He really was adamant about keeping it the way it was after he added those vocal effects. And I think the listeners felt that impact that I felt like, wow, this is really something... uh, profound and uh, life-changing going on in this song. (laughs) You know what I mean? True. Once you, truth. you hear it in that in that context that this could be a real person, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, and I think that's the thing that that made it so that made it so interesting was it did exactly what you said. You 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 hear this story that you guys told on that song, and it did make it very real that this could be happening, you know, literally down the street in the park down the street from my house. You know what I mean? Right. And right. in a, in a time where child abduction was a very real thing. You know, you think about we weren't too far removed from what was happening with all those with all those young young uh, boys and girls in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? At the mm-hmm. time, it was very, um, it was very, it was just a very real thing. And like I said, for me, one of the one of the songs on the on the album that made me go, "Yo, this is this is crazy. This is crazy deep right here." 
But um, yeah, but yeah, man, talking to Vex the Vortex, man, we just talking about uh, talking about the first the first album, the album that that uh, kind of put y'all on the scene. Another song from the album that was really deep that I think the, the you know this theme really rolled over into the second album, which we're gonna get into in a minute, was Mark of the Beast. Talk about mm-hmm. where that came from. Oh wow, um, Mark of the Beast culminated from some knowledge out in the world that we were unaware of dropping in our laps. Okay. Uh, Once again, on this first album, while people were deciding what their roles were in the group and what the subject, all these deep subject matters, another thing happened. You know what I mean? If you can believe that. (laughs) So (laughs) we're on our way to EMI one, one day and we're taking the subway. So... We end up at the 53rd and 3rd Avenue stop, which is just around the corner from the label. Okay. So we come out, and it's sort of like this eerie stop. It has a very narrow walkway, and the narrow walkway leads to this escalator that's like, I don't know. It seems like you're on this escalator for like 15 minutes. It's so high. You know, it takes you so high back up to get up to level. And while you're going up, there's people going down. It's just an eerie type of stop. Okay. So we get out of all of the escalators and we come out to turnstiles and it lets you out into a building. And as you're coming out of this subway station via building, you just start seeing 666 everywhere. <laughs> it's on the glass. It's on the trash cans. It's wow. just like 666. They even have a display that showed Michael um, Angelo's uh you know, depiction of God on, on the Sistine Chapel ceiling and had 666 on both sides of it. There's a Italia Roma uh, travel agency on that level. There was a Barnes and Nobles on that level. And it looked like a business office. Once you really came out into the center of it and you're about to exit, you could see that there were like doors with 666 on them that you go into and it takes you up into this building. Okay. So we get outside of the building. We look up. There's 666 on the top of the building in red. <laughs> and we noticed, you know, later on at night that it glowed and it glowed, you know, the number the number 666 in the sky in New York. Although nobody ever really talked about it. It was just something we noticed. And we were like, what is this? Yeah. You know, and why are they revering what is known as the Mark of the Beast okay. in such a way all over this building? Who are they? You know what I mean? But we went to the label that day, it sort of stuck out in the back of our minds. And we were like, yo, that would be interesting song to make, you know, to make, you know, that there's this number out there that man toys with for whatever reason that we've come to know is something bad, you yeah. know, so. We talked about it a little bit that day, but it really came to impact us when we met a brother named Dwight Robinson. Okay. Um, we moved to Queens once we got our recording budgets and we got, you know, the the deal with EMI. So we moved out to Laurelton, which is a part of Jamaica, Queens. And by chance, in a record store, we ran into this brother named Dwight. Okay. He was like a Rasta type dude. Very laid back and cool, almost on the same aesthetic that we were, seemed to have something special about him. So we were like, uh, you know, come by the, the house one day. Yeah. So we were all sitting in the basement talking. And this is something that um, one of my partners, Ivo Myers, also talks about, you know, as a speaker these days as well, that, you know, Dwight sort of brought this knowledge to us about the Sabbath. OK. And how the Sabbath was actually the day of rest and worship. Uh, rather than Sunday, which we had kind of been raised and taught to think was the first day of the week. And although it was the first day of the week, it was also the holy day of Sabbath and worship, which is why everybody goes to church on Sunday. And it's sort of a day of rest because all the businesses closed and blue laws were created. So Sunday, certain businesses can't open just to keep Sunday as this day for God. Okay. Okay. So... You know, he sits us down and he's like, yeah, all of that's been sort of established in this society. But what does the Bible say? Okay. You know, let's go down to the Ten Ten Commandments. He took us to the Ten Commandments. (laughs) What does that say? It's like, okay, it says that God rested on the seventh day. And the fact that God rested on the seventh day, he blessed it as the Sabbath. And we're like, wow. (laughs) You know, this veil was lifted from our minds. Basically, we're like, well, how can the whole world be revering Sunday if if seventh day is the pertinent day? Yeah, yeah. And God created the world in seven days and rested on the seventh day. 
But now mankind doesn't rest on the seventh day. And it all just kind of like grabbed us at that moment. And in that, we started being, you know, more of a revealing took place where Daniel and Revelation and the prophecies and a lot of the things that the Seventh Day Adventist Church teaches sort of got intermingled with our cipher. Okay. And what we felt we were, we could do in hip hop. So once we went back and when we, when we finally got our thoughts together and went into the studio, we were like, this has to be some type of part of our subject matter. Like we can't live our existence and go on stage and have people waving their hands and clapping for us now that we know this and we don't share this with people. You right. know what I mean? It was more one of those things. It wasn't so calculated and strategic like as we were coming up with the group, this was going to be the message we came up with. It was just a certain amount of things fell in our lap. We got exposed to the Tishman building, which is the name of the building. It was owned, It's owned by Tishman Realty. Okay. Um, they, built, they built Disney World. They built the Epcot Center. They built the Disney Super Center in New York or whatever. They're a very big realty company. Okay. Why they deal with this particular number, I guess, is another <laughs> another conversation. <laughs> and who else is affiliated with them, I guess, is another conversation. But, you know, being exposed to the Tishman building and to Dwight and the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it all sort of had a major influence on where we were as artists at the time. And it came out in the music, basically. Wow. That's crazy, though, because, you know, on, on so many different levels, one, the fact that you are, I mean, you're a group of young men and you're learning all these things that are obviously um, so, so different from the norm, like you're saying. I mean, you know, the majority of the world kind of kind of does one thing. And then now you're learning new information that causes you folk to decide to, to, to go a different path. And I think it does it does in a, in a great sense come across in your music but there's an interview and i don't remember i don't remember where i saw it it's somewhere on youtube there's an interview where you you folk were it looks like you were backstage and uh, someone interviews you guys you know just about like who you know who are the boogie monsters and woo 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 introduce yourself to the audience and i mean you guys really took a moment to sort of share your beliefs not even not even in regards to church but just in, in, in regards to life and the things that are happening around us you took that opportunity when you had that audience to to put that information out there um almost prophetically now when we look back you know 20 years later as uh you know looking at the things that are going on in the world right now which is just yeah. crazy to me yeah, it is kind of profound. I mean, there's actually a couple of instances on BET where they put the camera on us and we took advantage of it. There's also an interview with Joe Claire, as you might remember, at the Tishman building. Okay. Um, after we did that interview, EMI folded like a week later. What? <laughs> yeah, that was the story. You know, as soon as we did that interview and we covered those topics, EMI, like some people from overseas came to the regional office and they just basically told everybody to leave everything at their desks as it was and leave the label was no longer a part of the you know this this emi records group north america was no more and they were shutting it down at that point that day right there and everything could just be left as it was that's crazy bro that's crazy it is, it is. you know it shows you the real impact of music and initially, I didn't believe it had much to do, as much to do with Boogie Monsters as it did with the instability of the label at the time. Uh -huh. And I think it is viable to say, you know, they overspent. They had a lot of huge artists from Luther Vandross to Prince, you know, to uh, Guru, to pop artists that I could mention. Yeah. There's just a lot of people that they were putting budgeting behind at the time. Yeah. They had AZ as well, Bahamadia. And I think maybe it was a money issue, but a lot of people just kept telling me, Vex, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, son. No, no, no. Nah, wow. they shut down because they because of what y'all y'all were talking about. 
You know what I mean? And I'm like, really, really believe that EMI, the music mega force, was shut down around one artist, subject matter, especially me with my little sling. <laughs> I really you think I hit Goliath like that. They're like, yeah, don't uh, think you did hit Goliath like that because y'all covered some stuff that the United States and people affiliated within the United States may not want y'all to be talking about. It may not want you be, you know, want you to use EMI as a platform to be talking about. So just know that the label folded a week after your release because of what you released. <laughs> That's All right. crazy, bro. And it's just something to think about. That's how I look at it. I don't write it in stone that, you know, God sound came out and caused the EMI to stifle it. But I did sit down with David Segerson who was the president, and he told me, look, it's like World War Three in here. Yeah. If you can imagine this giant door coming down, about to close and slam, and your CD sliding out under that giant door, that's what's about to happen. I'm wow, like, really? bro. He's like, yeah. He's like, you may want to go talk to Steven over in business affairs and see what you can salvage because they're not talking to any of us. I'm the president, and I have to leave. He's the business affairs guy, and he has to leave. So go talk to him and see what's going on with your masters and like your publishing and all the stuff that this entails. So I go and sit down with Stephen Shapiro like, sir, okay, it looks like you know they're going to breach this contract. And being that you're in breach, you know, there's supposed to be some money cut. He's able to call me right back. So that's Dude, what happened. That's ridiculous, though. You know that that was kind of mind boggling there in the middle of this particular subject. All right. So I just had to I just let me just reset for a sec. Just so y'all know. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't tripping, man. Y'all could kind of hear like, you know, we was getting a little digital woo woo, whatever. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the call dropped, lost lost connection. And I hit the button, was able to get Vex right back. So, uh, so y'all, you know. Y'all, y'all take that and do with it what you, you know, what you will. But at any that's rate, what, that's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, man. Um, so let me let me back up just a little bit. Let me back up just a little bit. So Riders of the Storm came out that put y'all that put y'all on the scene. Um, and it's funny because as we go back now and look at, uh, well, I'm gonna tell you because I hit you up. I hit you up on social media and I was like, yo how can I get a copy? I want to get a copy of the album on vinyl. And you was like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to my homie, shout out to, uh, shout out to DJ Kez. He's a, he's a local DJ here in Portland. And he just, um, he had a record, a record store here that, so um, he just recently closed. But I went, I was like, yo, uh, Kez, how can I get a copy of, uh, I'm trying to get a copy of this album on vinyl. He was like, ah, oh, it's not, it's not easy. My point with all that is, you know, when you go and you look at what a lot of the um, reviewers and, and, and folk are saying about that album, about the Boogie Monsters in general, I've seen two things. I've seen one, um, people have people call you as a crew or and or that album in particular as just very um, underrated or not recognized as um, as the as the piece of art that it is. And then I've also heard people just say that. Um, you folks as a group, just a classic group, you know. And again, I think coming up in that time when that album was released, that we, you know, again we go back and look at it as the golden era of hip hop. It's, 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 it's just it's actually pretty cool to see the impact that you folk had with the material that you put out there, with the message that you put out there, um, in circles being seen as as a part of that golden age, man. Yeah, I consider it a miracle in myself, you know, and within itself just that that it that it happened and that so many people within hip hop were open to it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think um it's not the fact that the people within hip hop are not flexible and not open minded to you know, things that expand and expound on what's been done with it. I just think the industry and it becoming a marketing tool for a lot of folks and a way to cash in the big bucks for a lot of like major people in major markets. Um, it's, it's sort of like a turnstile, the direction of where hip hop could have gone or where it's going based on what sells and what's going to be viable in the marketing world and in the commercial world. Yeah. So 
it's sort of like a miracle in itself, the fact that all of that bearing down on hip hop allow people to still see it. It's also a miracle in itself that we got noticed by so many people because that same year, Big came out. Yeah. And that same year, Nas came out. Yeah. And that same year, was just it was ridiculous. Like, it was a big year for hip-hop. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, with the labels folding, and every time we came out, the label folded, basically. So, with that happening, and such other great artists coming out at the time, um, the fact that it went out of print so soon... The fact that the group didn't get to pursue the eight albums that it would have pursued yeah. had the label stayed open, I think it's great that people see us as such a big part of the golden era. Like um, I was telling you uh, previously when we spoke, for me, you know, I, I feel small and minute in it all. I don't really <laughs> feel like this huge cornerstone or big part of it because the artists before me have such huge track records and were able to continue touring and continue being exposed in the press and yeah. continuing to survive. I don't think that they're on the level of a lot of these quote unquote platinum artists of the day. Uh -huh. And, you know, you might see Kanye West put Q-Tip on his label, which is enigmatic when you would think Q-Tip would be the one that strived and became this super icon in hip hop and maybe put Kanye on his label. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? But the way the marketing and the way the stepping stones were laid, it sort of went another way, which a lot of us that are true to those eras prior to this new era in hip hop are kind of like, wait, 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 what y'all doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. What are y'all doing with the art form? What are y'all doing with the placement of the people that matter? You know, and where are the hip hop honors, the real hip hop honors for the real founders of this, and where are their precepts and their principles that they laid down? Because, yeah. you know, the industry and commercialization has caused a lot of that to sort of be retracted and replaced by other stuff because it's marketable. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's just, I think it's great that people still see us as a part of it and as a bigger part of it than maybe even I saw us as. <clears throat> Um, during that small time period where hip hop wasn't quite the thugged out trap music that it is today, and it wasn't quite the Jungle Brother, Tribe Called Quest, conscious native tongue type vibe prior. prior. There's yeah. a small gap in between, and to be included in that gap uh, where there's this pivot point is awesome. You know what I mean? And I don't feel like I've ever saw the commercial. Success I should have, you know, saw off of what I did with the group's two albums. Mm -hmm. With the labels folding, it's always been hard to pursue my royalties and money's earned and the tracking on the songs being played here or overseas. So it wasn't so so fabulous in that sense, but it was fabulous in the sense that I'm a part of it. Yeah. My name is there and... It's sort of like being an urban legend, too, where people <laughs> know about you, but they don't. And then they dig a little bit and they find out that you're real and you're tangible and they may have never heard of you before. I kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than being, you know, maybe one of the higher ups in hip hop history. It's kind of cool to be that person that folks got to dig for, too. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, I mean, and I think that that is one of the cool things with the resurgence of um, I think people looking for searching for more of the conscious the conscious MC, you know, and that hasn't gone away. I think it's it's just gotten overshadowed by a lot of what you spoke on in terms of what's marketed, sort of what's put out into the forefront. Um, but as people are going to look at more of that conscious material that um, and, and people are getting more into vinyl even nowadays um, and people are digging that they're finding sort of these gems that you folk put out. Um, you, uh, amongst other groups from from that era that you folks put out, that is different, and 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 hopefully bringing that back uh, to the masses or those people who are maybe just on the fringes who don't really understand um, what hip hop is as a whole uh, versus just rap music, and yeah. kind of bringing this back to the forefront. I think that's uh, it's actually a pretty a pretty cool thing. Uh, once again, chatting it up with uh with the homie Vex the Vortex of the Boogie Monsters. Um, so then so then you drop God Sound. Which it was just was just you and Mondo uh, on that project, and I've seen that project described as a little bit um, a little bit darker project. Uh, how would you describe it? When going into making making God sound, what was sort of the mindset going in to make that album? Um, 
is a transition for us as well as the listeners. The first record we sort of co-produced alongside uh, Derek Jackson, who was also our manager at the time. Okay. Um, we got our deal through Derek as well as Fran Sparrow. They were a team. So they sort of shopped us around and was able to expose us to people that we could possibly get signed with. Okay. So when we did the first album, they also, you know, felt like they, you know, wanted a certain amount of creative control to give the 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 group direction, to give the group some commerciality, to give the group things that it might be lacking. So in turn, Derek produced a lot of it, which we enjoyed. Um, sometimes we were at odds about the overall sound of the group, um, but. You know, at the end of the day, I think everybody was satisfied with what he came out with, his production on most of the album. Yeah. Um, once we got into the new deal, we weren't managed by them anymore. Um, with the label with Pendulum folding and becoming a, a, an e EMI artist directly on EMI, David Seegerson offered me creative freedom. He said, you know, I kind of saw you possibly stifled in your first uh, project effort with so many people having input on what you'd like to do. Yeah. Um, he said he had listened to a lot of the stuff I had done like on my own, on my own without, you know, so many influences, whether they were the group or the, uh, or the managers. And he was like, you remind me of some Russian composer. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, your stuff sounds like this Russian composer. And I like the, you, to, you to go into the studio with Mondo right. and just you two just go nuts. He was like, I'm not even going to go in the studio and check on you guys and see what you're doing or how it sounds because I like your sound and I trust that you're going to develop it and come up with another creative project. Yeah, yeah. So from the outside looking in, not knowing the production situation on the first album and the difference with that um, on the second album, from the outside looking in, you might not notice why we were transitioning. You just knew it sounded different. Right, right. You know what I mean? Had we gone into the first album being more producer rolled and more, uh, I guess, more on the actual samples and sounds that we really, really wanted to use for the first project, the second project probably would have been more cohesive as far as, wow, this one sounds different. Got you. I could get people saying it sounded darker um, to a degree, yeah. to a degree. Yeah. I think there was still some fun sounds on there, like... Uh, Riders of the Storm. Yep. At the same time, we had matured. Uh, the message had developed even more because more stuff fell in our lap and more information, you know, was revealed to us during that time period that we wanted to put into our music rather than it just be, you know, I guess street street cred music. You know what I mean? Right. So we just challenged ourselves. We um, had faith in our own sound. You know, we didn't feel like it was any lesser than what Riders of the Storm was. It was just us in our essence. Yeah. So me and Mondo just went in there. Like I said, we went bananas. We pulled out our SP-1200s. We pulled out the records that we liked. And we went in there and like put together stuff that we felt represented us you know, as producers and, and lyricists, I guess you should say. No doubt. No doubt, man. Vex the Vortex of the Boogeyman. So we're talking about God's sound. So let me just run it down. I got the track list in front of me. Um, first off, Having Bahamadia on Say Word was was dope. I mean, I think that was a, um, a dope, a, a, obviously a dope artist. But I think that was she added something really cool. I think to the to the overall sound of the of the record. So what she, she had kills her. it, <laughs> she kills it, as she always does. You know what I mean? Bahamadia is just she's got the tool set. You know what I mean? She's got the skills, the tools. Um, I was there during that session when she recorded a part. She was bananas, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was early, and she sort of shook that off. And when she shook that off, it was basically on. Like, she was all about it. So, shouts to her. Much respect to Bahamadia. No Philly. Doubt. No doubt. Um, but then she's sort of talking about sort of the differences, um, even within this album. Um and y'all need to y'all just need to go check it out if y'all can find it. Uh the lunchroom table is dope. Just that whole concept, you know what I mean? Because that takes me back to that takes me back to middle school, you know what I'm saying? Where you get somebody just on the on a lunch on the lunch on a lunch table with, you know, with the beat and people yeah. just I mean that's that's like real, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was dope. And then Whistles in the Wind is probably my favorite, my favorite track from uh from that album. So y'all need to go pick that up, man. Go find go find God Sound. 
Um, it's on. Um, it's all over the place. Go check out Discogs. Go check out eBay. You know, go find that. So, drop that album, and then that was it. Boogie Monsters as a crew was no more. Yep. That's crazy, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm still waiting. For, I'm still waiting on the third album. I know y'all. I know y'all working on that, right? No, I'm nah, it's not gonna happen, <laughs> fam. <laughs> you can get some Vex the Vortex songs right now, but as far as anything out from artists within the group, I think I'm the only one still punching that clock. You know what I mean? Wow, wow. Well, I mean, and that and that's sort of the next thing is um, the fact that after that, and probably even during that you connected with a lot of other artists. I mean, there's there's definitely other material that you can find out there where you were doing guest spots on um on other people's tracks. I mean it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there that people can find. And then as a solo artist you also have released a number of uh, a number of projects. So let's just speak on that man. Um one on on collabing versus um just creating your own material. Um you know, do you have a what's your process for for finding artists to build with and what's your what's your process for uh, just continuing on the path that you started as an artist way back in the day um i think it was all just sort of like it was a continuing wave of energy from boogie monsters i mean not being on a major label anymore you know i just went back to doing it for the love so the revolutionary war strategic minerals uh, Malcolm Vex, all those other projects were just me sitting in the lab, coming up with ideas, not only song ideas, but, you know, composition ideas like, OK, an album as a composition would consist of these songs for Vex the Vortex at this particular time. Yeah. And with MP3s and the digital world and all of that coming about, I also foresaw the music market being what it is now and not being so record store driven, CD driven, and there being this digital market, even back as early as 1999, 1998, before it developed to what it is. And um, I just felt like, okay, let me show other artists that they could take advantage of that. Yeah. And they don't have to be on a major label to have people that enjoy their music pick up a copy whether it's an MP3 or whether it's on CD or if you can afford to put out vinyl. I would have liked to put out vinyl on all of my projects, but budgeting wise, it just wasn't in the cards for me, you know? So I just used the digital realm and the internet as my avenue for those time periods where if you were really into Boogie Monsters and you wanted to know where Vex was as an artist at that point in time, yeah. Those were my ideas, and they may not have the best mix downs and masters like the Boogie Monsters material, but you will get to see where I'm at as an MC, and and you know vocally where I, what I was doing, um, as well as sort of just letting people who are interested in me because of what they had heard from the Boogie Monsters do songs with me. So most of the collaborations I did, which are probably up around twenty twenty five or more, yeah. Just people like, look, I don't have a lot of budgeting, but I love your work. I would love to do a song with you just to put my audience onto you and what you do. Some of my friends know about you. Some of my friends don't. By you doing a song with me, it opens up your audience to my audience and vice versa. And just on the love of you know what you've done for my life or for hip hop. I want to do a song with you and this is what I can offer you or whatever, whatever. So a lot of times I might not even get a dollar for some of those songs and the people are out there still marketing them on the internet, you know, getting whatever they can on residual sales on the song that we did. And I think that's great that those artists had an opportunity based on working with me to have a a piece of, hip hop culture out there for themselves. So most of that was all just done on the love, really. Sometimes it was, you know, contracts and agreements and actual payments, but more of it was just sort of like a cipher where you run into MCs that, you know, feel your material and want to do something to collaborate with you. That's what's up, bro. Got to give got to give a couple quick shout outs too. I know um, a number of the artists that, or a couple at least a couple of the artists I saw that you were collabing with, I found through Sphere Hip Hop. So I got to shout out to my homie Plastic over at, at Sphere Hip Hop. And then I was talking to uh, to my homie up here in Portland, um, 
I think he's going to be okay with me putting this story out there, but um, he goes by the name of Theory Has It. And uh, I was like, yo, you know, you know, Vex from the Boogie Monsters. He was like, yeah, I know Vex because Theory, before he changed his name to Theory Has It, used to go by Vex. <laughs> and so he said, like, some sometime back in the day, talking about how you utilize the the tools available to you, because I know that you were doing your thing on MySpace, like, way back in the day. Yeah. Theory said he hit you up on MySpace and was like, yo, I go by Vex, woo, woo, woo. Um, so it's just funny how things, you know, how, how how we're able to utilize these tools to connect with uh you know to connect with artists and and just build man just build a community uh it's just it's really really dope that being said i need to try to connect i'm i'm i'm, I'm putting this on i'm putting this on tape right now i need to to connect you and my homie theory because uh he's kind of nice like that but and i know that you still doing i know that you still putting out material so now um the last project you put out, you just dropped it last year, didn't you? Your latest project? Yeah. Um, speak on that right quick, because it's got like 417 songs on it or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got the 373737. That's um, crazy. Yeah, it's just a mixtape. Uh, it's called The Muddy Contender. I've been selling it for a year now. I'm starting to kind of close it out as the sales dwindle and slow down. But um, yeah, it's 37 songs. There's an unreleased song on there by Boogie Monsters called Ali and the Devil. Okay. Really, really dope song. We did it with this band called Inca Jazz, which is like a Native American jazz band. Oh, wow. Um, and Mondo's verse, he actually takes a trip to hell. And in my verse, I take a trip to heaven, and we both end up back on earth. And it was sort of like a major piece of the God sound album that never got heard so oh, wow. that's on there um a lot of collaborations with artists that have just stuck by me through all of the years and been like yo one day when you get settled i want to do a song with you and you know times went by and we didn't really you know get to the song i did a lot of uh songs with artists that i've been meaning to do songs with basically yeah um and a lot of self-production you know what i mean challenging myself to produce do tracks um, do the whole the whole thing, write it, do the beat, you know what I mean? Wow. So yeah, it's thirty seven songs. You may be able to still find it on iTunes, Amazon if you hurry up. <laughs> you know, I'm a sort of like a demand artist. If you don't if I don't see the numbers where they are, I'm not gonna keep throwing it out there to y'all. So if you need if you need a copy, go grab it now. <laughs> if I see a thousand moved, I might keep it out there for y'all for real. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up, man. The Vex the Vortex. Um, and so then you have you have maintained um, sort of a real dope uh, social media um, connect. So if people want to try to try to see what you're what you're getting into, let them know how they can find you on uh, on social media, right quick. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you could get me on YouTube at Vex the Vortex, youtube.com slash user slash Vex the Vortex, V E X D A V O R T E X. Um, I got 120,000 plays there. I appreciate everybody that's been supporting the YouTube channel. Um, I'm also on Instagram under Vex the Vortex. So if you would like to see some ill visuals, I do a lot of photography, graphic design work. Um, as you probably know, but the average person probably just thinks I'm a lyricist, but you know, I'm a visual artist. I was a visual artist first. So if you like to see some of the stuff that I'm doing in the digital world, as far as art, um, Instagram, you could catch me over there. Um, yeah, that's probably the two main places I really like do a lot of my networking from. That's what's up. So that's what I wanted to transition into was the fact that, um, you do you you do have uh like there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of stuff out there in terms of the visual arts that you've done um so that's been that has been a passion of yours then throughout this whole musical journey as well oh no doubt no doubt i was actually originally a visual artist like i was trained to be a fine artist in high school okay so before the music really took off for me i was a lot of times doing paintings sculptures uh, drawing, sketches, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I was trained in high school. When I went to Virginia State, I took up commercial art and fine arts as my major, okay. although hip-hop was always there, sort of like 
right there, you know what I mean, in the front of my head, like, okay, this is where I want to go, and then maybe add the visual art thing into it further on down the line or whatever. Okay. So I always kind of had the MC aspiration, but um, yeah, I took it on from there. I've recently graduated from the University of Baltimore, so I have my Bachelor of Science in Simulation Digital Entertainment. Congrats, congrats on that, my brother. Appreciate it. So now it's just taking the stuff I've learned in commercial and fine arts and sort of morphing it into the digital arts and 3D modeling and game design. So sort of like a culmination of all of the visual stuff that I picked up over the years and I'll be pursuing my master's this fall. So once I get my master's degree, I'm hoping to maybe enter that as another field, another creative outlet where I can get, you know, things in my head out, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up, man. And then um, I know that again, the, you've done some pretty cool stuff. Some of the, some of the, the photos that I've seen you post on social media are pretty crazy. And there's a, there's a theme, there's sort of a common theme there. Um, you do some, some really neat stuff with the lion photos, man. You want to speak on that right quick? Um, just goes back to stuff I've, I've studied. You know what I mean? If you study prophecy, you know about the lion of Judah in revelation five, five, it says that, the elders and all of those in heaven, they searched through the whole universe and they couldn't find anyone in heaven or on earth worthy to open the book of the seven seals. Wow. So they were distraught. And then at some given moment, behold, no need to weep. The conqueror lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof. That's what's up. So in, in that, that grabbed me as a scripture, you know, that, Okay, a lot of people say this book is written by white people and Christianity is something imposed on black people by the slave master. Uh -huh. But yet in this book, I'm reading it and the first country mentioned is Ethiopia. And the last thing that's mentioned is a lion. <laughs> and lions are, are native to the regions of Africa. And Solomon was in, in love with a woman who was black. I've started finding myself in all of these scriptures yeah and i'm like well how come we are refuting ourselves wow and if we are a stolen people how do we know that these texts aren't stolen <laughs> they did come into egypt <laughs> and, and infiltrate the throne and take over that group of people what makes us think that these texts are are really like derived from english or from rome or from catholicism even Come How do now. we know there's not a deeper level and this hasn't something else that wasn't taken per se? But yeah, the Lion of Judah is a powerful icon to me because it shows even in this thing that people have ostracized as theirs, we see ourselves yeah. if we dig deep enough. A lot of folks just know what they know and they don't want to see it see anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. Similarly to the Sabbath, when you start bringing up the Sabbath versus Sunday, um, they they just been on that page for enough time that they don't want to see anything else new or old that may be pertinent brought to the subject matter, so to speak. So when you see that lion, I'm letting you know, look, the lion of Judah and the tribe of Judah, who are they? And why, why was he worthy to open the book of seven seals in the last book of the Bible? Ask yourself, you know what I mean? <laughs> Revelation 5.5. 5. Uh, Bob Marley and the Rasta movement, they also revered the Lion of Judah. Some of them be believe it to be Haile Selassie, I, who was the emperor of Ethiopia. Um, they felt it was Christ incarnate, or Christ come back in this physical form as him as the king. But even there, when you go to Ethiopia and you look at the flag, there's this lion that they... they uh, identify as the Lion of Judah on the flag. Some identify him to be that king, that particular king, but it's also another interesting aspect of uh, black culture where you see this lion uh, emerge and they call it the Lion of Judah. So I always try to sort of like emphasize that. Uh, the vortex is also a theme, you know, I run with a lot. That's inspired by Job 38.1 where the Lord speaks to Job out of a whirlpool or a vortex or a whirlwind. I believe is put in in most of the translations that's always compelled me to sort of focus on the vortex like well hmm why did god speak from a whirlwind so to speak you know what i mean and where is this whirlwind what is this whirlwind and if job was exposed to it was it something visual for him 
or is it just inspired by the writer who wrote that particular passage to say, well, it was something like a whirlwind that Job experienced God speak from? Somewhere out there is a vortex, though. <laughs> <laughs> Or a black hole, so to speak. Man, Vex in here dropping knowledge, man, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Artist, scientist, builder, you know. I'm trying to make things happen in a lot of different directions, um, not just music-wise. And I hope people follow that and get that from me, you know what I mean? No doubt, no doubt. Well, I I mean, you know, and again, people who have have the opportunity to, to tap into your perspective on on life and 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 the experience that you've had may have also seen the vex vortex uh confrontation chronicles i had to get into that bro yeah 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 and we were supposed to cover the no justice no money yeah thing that's too. That, that's where we had and that's exactly where we had man so um you've and and it's not i mean really and i'm gonna let you i'm gonna let you let everyone know uh, what it what it is, but you know it's it's you kind of speaking on your your personal experiences, things that um, that you have gone through. Well, let me let me let you just let me let you break it down, man. What is what what is the confrontation chronicles, and what sort of led you to share that? Well, that's something I'm doing on my Facebook page, and um, there I share a lot of stuff with my closer friends, people that are close to me, that relate to me and really know me from school or from work or other aspects of like where my mind is when I'm not studying or not, you know, recording music or being creative. Sometimes my wall, you know, it'll it'll take on some social issues as well as philosophy or proverbs or what have you. Yeah. So with the Michael Brown thing going on, I just felt this need to be active. Although I can't be there in Ferguson, it was just like, I need to get active. I need to start making statements to the people that, you know, give ear to me and start saying how some of this injustice is just ridiculous. Yeah. So the Confrontation Chronicles was... Uh, Basically, so far, it's three pieces, and they're each story is about times I, were, I was confronted by the police. Okay. So, in a way, it was empowering for me because I have these stories that I've kept to myself for years. You know what I mean? Where police have confronted me and left me feeling violated and harassed and treated unfairly. And had I got out of line, so to speak, or had I said anything more than what was said, I could have been a Michael Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Or a Trayvon Martin yeah. or Sean Bell, you know, and to see this story repeat itself over and over again in black history that some young black man was lynched, shot, hung, harassed, violated in some way, shape or form made me want to share those stories with people that know me to know why my pre- premise on the authority of the police is what it is. So in those particular chronicles, one is talking about me driving my car, like a lot of black people say that, you know, they get stopped while they're, you know, they're black while driving, which is, you know, a violation in some areas. And I get pulled over and I get curbed and sat on the curb, even though there's no probable cause to stop my vehicle and basically have my glove box attempted to be broken into by the police. Yeah. Who are just stopping me randomly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think that particular chronicle held some impact because at the end of this search, illegal, you know, search attempt, the cop asked me if I knew Ben Laden. Which is just like, really, dude? <laughs> really? <laughs> you know? And when I wrote it, I said, I don't know how I must have looked at him, but I can't imagine the expression I must have gave this gentleman when he said that, you yeah. know? I guess it was supposed to provoke me to anger but I, I just looked at him like he was ridiculous. Like, really? Yeah. That's what you're going to say to me yeah. to try to make me feel some type of way about myself, huh? Yeah. yeah. I have to be affiliated with Bin Laden because I'm suspicious to you and you're pulling me over for no reason. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's what? a few times in my life I've been in situations like that where, you know, without provocation, the police ended up in very close range of me and doing things I felt violated my rights. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, man, and I think that it's important to have, uh, have an opportunity to share those stories because I think so often, um, it was interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine and he was talking about someone who made a comment that, um, 
she and her group of, of, of influencers didn't really see what the big deal was. And this was a person who didn't, you know, who lives in an area where she is not, um, she, 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 she hasn't been exposed to these, to these sorts of things. My point is, is that I think it's important to have people who, to share these stories, to let people know that this really does happen all of the time to the person that you might work with or to the person that you might go to the gym with or that you might go to church with, or, I mean, this, this happens to people that you know. And so it's not, it it is something that affects us all. um, Even if you don't live in that, in that society. So I wanted to be sure that, um, that we shared that, but then you took it a step further, even beyond just sharing those stories is you created, you created a place where uh, all of us can come together and um, and contribute to this community. You created an, uh, a a page on Facebook. Uh, no justice, no money. Uh, speak on that right quick. Yeah, if you if you're on Facebook, you can join the movement. It's basically Facebook.com/slash No Justice question mark No Money. Um, and what I saw was I, I went and I was like, okay, we're marching a lot. And marching does, you know, have a lot of action because we get to see how many people are in outrage about a particular social issue. And in this instance, the one that was coming to a head was the Michael Brown uh, homicide, murder. And um, it was just like a lot of people marching. A lot of people decided to do looting and bust into Walmart and take stuff and bust into mom and pop stores and take stuff. And it's like, okay, some of that stuff is in your own community. And now you're going to have even less to work with and less resources for food or for water or for what have you, because you destroyed something, you know, within your own community. Um, When it came time for the protesters to get to other communities, we saw what happened. You know what I mean? The National Guard was called in. The police were there in riot gear to stop this thing from going into communities where the money is, you know, so. I got to thinking and I and I decided to Google financial protesting. What is financial protesting? How can you protest financial financially? And I didn't find anything. <laughs> of course nothing. not. You know that. <laughs> they ain't gonna nothing. let that out there. Right. There was nothing on that first page that had anything to do with it. It was just miscellaneous stuff. So yeah. I'm like, you know, when we got tired of being put on the back of the bus, everybody said, you know what, tomorrow we're not riding that bus. Because they disrespecting us to the point where we got to boycott this particular avenue of, of, of business that we're putting our revenue and our money into every day. Yeah. And I was like, we could do the same thing to, you know, now if we organized it, you know, um, on, on Tuesday, no one rides the bus or gives any bus fares as a protest, as an act of solidarity to this show. We're not going to be putting up with this you know, shoot a brother and there's no explanation as to how it was warranted or why, you know, we can cut our, cut off a lot of empowered things in the system. We don't agree with by cutting off our money. Yeah. You know, we spend $300 on sneakers and, and Louboutin heels for women. And we put all our money into these commercial avenues where people who don't necessarily want us in those things get a hold of those dollars. Yeah. And then they go and support organizations that allow the police to have military gear and tanks and come into the um, community and bust you upside your head because we've empowered them with not only our docile aspects of our, you know, our culture, you know, we don't do a lot in a lot of instances. Only when things are really terrible do we all stand up and say, look, no justice, no peace. But also with our money, with our commercial viability. So by not supporting the buses and trains on Monday and Tuesday, not supporting fast food and on Wednesday, not supporting the movies, those areas where a lot of the money is siphoned out and placed in the other places like you know privatized prisons <laughs> we can make a difference yeah so i decided to start a page right now we're meeting like 200 people within our first week and i'm still promoting the page in hopes of getting as many followers as i can to basically follow a protocol until we feel like we've had justice against police brutality and against uh the shameless combing of our neighborhoods for people to lock up yeah. For frivolous reasons, because it's happening in every metropolitan area, 
we're being combed for people that we can identify and lock up, whether they've necess- you know, necessarily done anything wrong or not. In a lot of instances, they haven't. They're just being randomly picked up. And it's in even worse instances being murdered. Yeah. Yeah. While they're trying to grab you or pick you up, which I think everyone has witnessed in this Michael Brown case, that this person, although was supposedly supposed to be an unarmed robber, was walking down the middle of the street. The cop told him to get on the sidewalk. He said, look, I'm almost home. And this cop backed up, hit him with the car door and it turned into a confrontation where the cop took his life. Yeah. So how many times are we going to stand back and see this happen? still go and give the TV our ratings or still go put money in, you know, McDonald's or Jordan's or Louboutins or Google or this or that, you know, we could take that money and empower ourselves if we do nothing else, or we can just not put it into the hands of those who are going to use it in ways that are detrimental to us. I feel. Which is, which is, which is true. And the sad, the sad truth is, is that, Unfortunately, and I and I and I know that I've been a part of this as well. We've had in my lifetime significant things that have that have gone on in the community, and we all stand up and say, "Well, we're not going to take this, and this, you know, this isn't right." But I think what history shows us is that if folk just wait it out, we all end up going back to just the norm, which is sad. And I think what you're, you know. I think what you're what you've created here is an opportunity for us to continue to speak in ways that uh, will be impactful moving forward, not just something that will um, be present when people are 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 riding on emotion, but that people can actually think through and process and and continue to to strive to to make a difference. So shout out to you, brother, for doing that. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a desensitization. You know, we get desensitized. um when things like this happen and we see it prevalent or so much that naturally our reaction isn't going to be on the same energy level after we've, you know, after we see it a a few times, we sort of get desensitized to it. We don't react with the same fervor. And by keeping like a small movement like that out there where you're consciously every day, you're thinking, okay, am I supporting the wrong things? Am I putting my money in the wrong places? Am I putting it into the hands of someone who's looking to, cause my demise with the money I think having that daily to think about uh, helps us not to be desensitized and kind of gives us some traction to step forward and take action in some sort of way no matter where we are and that's another thing not everybody can be in Ferguson right now though we'd like to be right. you know protesting or trying to make a difference so that's a way for all of us to make a difference where we are you know what today it's to get this thing straight until I see some sort of justice for Izell Ford or Eric Garner or uh, Kajimi or Michael Brown. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put my money into the system today in this particular way. I understand people have kids and families and you got to do what you got to do, you know, but there's a lot we don't have to be doing. That's what's up. You know, Vex the Vortex, man. Yo, brother, once again, I. I I can't I can't say thank you enough, man, for for coming through and uh and, and being a part of this, man. It's been it's been such an honor to, you know, to just uh to chop it up with you for for a minute, man. Thank you, brother. All day, spit it in the hallway, vex the vortex, keeping it the four way. We don't move backwards, we move trackwards on these slackets. We coming through to attack this, demolish, abolish all slavery of the mental mind. Vex the vortex, breaking chains and shine. We're gonna come back, rewind once again in time when we do this again. Vex the vortex, spin, let us begin. <laughs> That's what's up. That's the homie right there, man. Be on the look for more from 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 Vex the Vortex, man. Um, and this 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 ain't gonna be no one time thing, man. I gotta definitely get you back up in here before it's all said and done. You know, that would be cool, man. We gotta bring some music into it next time or something. That would be great. That's what's up. We definitely gonna do that, man. Y'all uh, check out my man Vex the Vortex all over social media, and uh, God willing, we'll be back to do it again. All right, y'all. Peace. Peace.